Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here, and welcome back to some continuing coverage of D100 Dungeon World Builder, uh, with the World Builder expansion, I should say. So we're just gonna do a couple things in this video today. Uh, one, we're gonna go over a little bit about uh, the details of uh, generating a quest, because I've seen a couple questions pop up about how to determine certain things. And then we are also going to go down into the dungeon and do a f maybe a few turns of a quest that I am currently on. Uh, this is not going to be like a how to play video when we get into the quest section. So just keep that in mind because I do make always a ton of rules mistakes, especially on a camera. So it'll just be, a, uh, you'll get an idea of how to play the game using the mapping game expansion. But in D100 Dungeon, when you generate a quest, it is a little bit different than in the original. So in the original, you would roll on your quest chart and your quest chart would give you absolutely everything you need to, uh, to go on that quest. It would tell you like what the quest was. It would give you your encounter modifier. Basically, it would tell you um, a result that you would add or subtract from your role when you are generating a combat encounter with the lower numbers of monsters being easier and the higher on the chart being more difficult. So the earlier quests, the quests in the book go from easy to hard and then as they get harder then you will have, um, you will be adding to your roles and the easy quests start where you are um, subtracting from your roles. And then you also get your um, results for if you are the S there, if you successfully complete the quest or the F for if you fail the quest and what happens. So in the World Builder expansion, there are maybe like two extra steps to that process. Whereas that one in the main book, there's just one step. But the, uh, the world builder does add a little bit to that. So we're gonna take a look just a little bit about how that, and also um, one thing that I really like about how the world builder handles it. So uh, the same thing in the world builder game, the quests start easy and get more difficult as they go up on the chart. And the game actually does recommend that when you are starting your initial map and you are generating your first few quests, to go ahead and only use a D10 to generate those uh, first few quests because the first 10 are kind of like the easy quests. And so you will roll a D100 and you will generate a quest here. So what this does, so let's say we were to generate uh, lost goodies, okay, we roll a five. And um, this says to collect two items from different barrels or chests or objective items. And we would hand those in, so we'd have to re remove those from our inventory once we find them and give them to a person, okay? And this says that this person had some important artifacts stolen and hidden inside a dungeon and now needs them back. So the first few quests are your basic just kind of um, retrieval quests. As always, I have the beginning quest of any RPG. But so what this adds is this actually adds two kind of uh, different elements. One is the person, which is kind of a variable. And the other is this column here, this Q, uh, like, uh, currency sign and that is the quest reward value column and this plays an important part in kind of dictating how lucrative your rewards will be and also this will eventually dictate your encounter modifier so the first thing you want to do is when you see this word person in brackets that means it's time to roll on the names chart and the names chart, of course, has all kinds of different names, uh, different ways to generate names for your settlements, different ways to generate people and hex names and mount names. So when you're told to generate a person for a quest, you roll a D100 and you consult this chart. So let's take a pretty extreme example. 
Now let's say you rolled a one on your um, chart there. And so that would be a king. So a king has lost some items and he wants you to go into a dungeon and retrieve those items for him. Well, he has a plus eight to the quest rewards column. So that pushes that very beginning quest with a quest reward value of zero up to eight. Some hexes and other circumstances might also add or subtract uh, modifiers to your quest reward value. Once you know your quest reward value, so in this case it was an eight, then you would turn to the quest reward uh, table here. And you would look at what your quest reward value, your total modified value is. In this case, it would have been an eight. And then you go ahead and you roll a D6. And then that tells you that if you are successful, you gain uh, 1800 gold pieces. If you fail, you lose one of your primary dex stats and you have an encounter modifier of plus 10, meaning that you have a better chance of going up against some more powerful enemies when you are having an encounter. So you have two different variables that are going to uh, change the quests. What is also cool is let's say that that was like the fourth quest that you rolled up on your map. Okay, at by that point, you would probably, your character might still be a little too weak to take on that quest. But what's cool is that you just know about that quest. So that quest could be somewhere off in the distant land. Uh, you know, maybe you've heard about it and it's up here in the north or something or down here in the south. And you just know that the king wants you to do that. And you can do that at some point. Now that quest didn't have a time limit. So you could take your time going around looking for rumors, looking for other easier quests before tackling that quest. Some quests will have a time limit that you are going to have to solve by a certain date, like two weeks from now or three weeks from now or something like that. And so that puts a little bit of time pressure on your ability to choose which quest to go to. But having multiple quests out and having choices is one thing that you want to do in the world builder game. You want to get a few different choices out there so you're not just kind of um, railroaded into a certain quest that maybe you're not ready for yet. So what that does really is kind of add another um, decision point to the game where you are able to more carefully choose which quest you want to go on based on the rewards, maybe based on the encounter modifier and so on. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the dungeon. I am uh, just a couple turns into a dungeon here that I am trying to do um, quest number two here on my sheet, which is I have to hand in three items from chart I, item the item chart in the base book, to an elf. And uh, it has a quest modifier, of a rewards modifier of zero, which means I'm going to have a minus 40 encounter and if I solve this quest, if I complete the quest, I'll get 50 gold. If I fail the quest, escape for some reason, or maybe die, then I will lose half my gold. And as you start generating more gold, those failure results of losing some gold become more and more heinous, um, let me tell you. So usually the encounter modifier would apply to any uh, D100 roll you're going to make. But because I am playing with the mapping game and the mapping game actually uses little tokens for uh, generating encounters. So there's a table in the mapping game book that tells you which counters you are going to use for your encounter modifier. So at a minus 40, which we are at, we are going to be using encounters, uh, chits numbers one through 18. We'll be drawing one of those at random when we have an encounter. And then we will be consulting uh, any of the cards 1 through 18, which are going to be our monsters that we are going to have to fight. I'm not showing how to play, so if I make any rules errors, just ignore them. Um, just kind of giving a little sample of, of uh, the gameplay here as we're going through a dungeon. 
So I do have this handy sheet here. I think I got this, it's actually called the handy sheet. And I think I got this from BGG, but I just laminated it. And it has some of the charts, which you are going to be using a lot in combat, such as your monster reaction charts, your hit location charts, a, um, the outline of a combat round, what to do when you want to escape, and also what to do um, on your turn. So we're kind of in the middle of a turn here, and I just discovered or I just um, revealed this tile here. But what happened is this, this is a green tile. That means that it has a geographic location. And um, so I drew from my geographic location chit. Instead of rolling, you draw a chit and then you would consult your book here. This geographical location here was actually a lever. And the lever and key system in D100 Dungeon is pretty interesting. It's kind of abstract, but I like the way it, um, I like the way it works. So as you discover more levers and more keys, you fill in the pips. And then when you need a key or a lever to open a door or something, you roll a D10 and you have to roll under that value, meaning that one of those levers you pulled or one of those keys you have found is the key you need to open that door or the lever that was needed to be pulled to have opened that door. It's kind of an interesting system. I like it. It's easy. You don't really have to keep track of certain keys for certain doors. It's a little abstract, but it works. But anyway, so this was G49, and G49 is a portcullis. So we would turn to our uh, huge table here of our geographic locations, our geographic um, encounters, I should say. And so we have the portcullis here, and it's a large iron portcullis, uh, blocks the way across the entrance to this area of the dungeon. It will need to be lifted and wedged open, or the adventurer will be forced to return to the area they were last in. Uh, we have to draw a portcullis. Okay, we don't need to do that. Uh, cross the entrance sheet and mark it with uh, G49. So this token here represents that. The adventurer cannot proceed into the new area until this has been uh, marked with a check mark, which it has been opened. The adventurer may attempt to lift the portcullis as many times as they wish until it is lifted or they give up trying. Okay, so to lift the portcullis, we have a test that we have to take. And that test is a strength test at minus 15. And if we succeed, then we open it. If we fail, we lose an HP and we have to uh, spend time on our time tracker. So it takes time and strength to open up this door here. And uh, we can use our strong ability. So my, um, my strength here is, uh, my adjusted strength is 65. I do not have the strong skill. So what is it? 65 minus 15 is 50. So I have a 50% chance to open up this portcullis and I'm going to try to do that now. Move that. Okay, here we go. Um, 83, okay, so I did not open that portcullis. And so I would lose one HP, maybe it slammed down on my fingers or something. So that's gonna take me down to 17 total HP or current HP, I should say. And I have to mark a time. So the next time marker I have to mark here does have my little oil symbol. So that's gonna cost me another piece, another uh, flask of oil. So I have to fill that dot in. And I have 20 flasks of oil right now. So that was the end of that turn. I've already searched in this room because there's a token here. So now it is the next turn. And at the top of the turn, the first thing you do is you check off another time on your timer. Okay, so we're gonna check off six. There's nothing special that happens at, at uh, six o'clock there. Okay, so now I have a choice. I can try to interact with this portcullis again, trying to open it. Or I could just try to go over to this exit over here and continue to explore along the way. I think I'm going to try one more time to open this. So here we go. Again, I need to do that test, which was a 50% chance on my strength. And there we go. Oh, almost a success, a, um, an experience roll. So that was a 16. So this 
token is removed and it is actually put back in our pool of tokens there. And so since I successfully interacted with that, then I can go ahead and move into this green tile here. Now, this green tile, it wasn't newly placed, so we don't draw a new geographic location. I can search this tile though. Let's talk about our experience roles real quick. So anytime you make a test, anytime you see this kind of formula, which is a test, block escape, it tells you your, your, your stat that you're rolling, it tells you your failure or your success. Anytime you see that formula, that is considered a test. And anytime you make a roll and your roll is 10 or less, then you get to upgrade any of the stats or skills one uh, that was used in making that test. So let's say that I had rolled a 10 for that test and I used that, that test could use strong or it could, it used strength. So I could choose to upgrade my, uh, add a point of experience to my strength or to my strong skill. So it's a really cool kind of like random way to upgrade your character as you are playing. So we've moved into this new area. Now I can search and different color tiles have different search modifiers. And so in this case, this is a green tile, which that is going to give me a plus five. And that is going to be on the F chart here. And the find chart is kind of a risk reward. There are some bad things. You can get poisoned, you can get diseased, you can get attacked by a, by a monster. You can just waste time. There are all kinds of different things that could happen to you when you are searching a tile, but it's usually worth the uh, risk, I think. So we're going to go ahead and search that. We're gonna add a plus five here. And oh, that was fantastic. All right, 99. So that puts us over 100. Okay, so we're over 100. And um, that does not cost us any time. And this says, uh, shifting through the rubbish strewn about the floor, the adventurer is startled to find a skeleton. It has been a good source of nourishment for the small insects and rats that inhabit the dungeon. A quick search reveals the poor chap had very little at the time of his death. That is all apart from this magnificent treasure. So we're going to roll on table TC minus 15. Okay, so let's find table TC. So this is the treasure table. Okay, so we rolled a 39 there on our TC. And so let's see what we found. We found an objective item. An objective item is found that may be required for a quest. Check the current quest details. If it is not needed for the quest, it is instead a valuable item. The player adds its gold piece value. Okay, so we found we don't need an objective item because we're trying to find items from a certain table. Actually, we are trying to find items, though we're trying to find items from table I. So what we did is we just found some kind of trinket that is actually going to be worth 250 gold pieces. Okay, that is not bad at all. 250 gold pieces is nothing to laugh at. So I'm just going to add that to my uh, sheet here. Okay, so we added our gold. We did our search, so we're going to add a little search token here to show that we searched that area. And now we are at the top of a turn. So the first thing we have to do is we have to add time. And so this time here, that brings us up to this little marker here, which I use as an exclamation point five, which means we have a, a one in five chance of being attacked by a wandering monster. So let's go ahead and roll our D10 here. And we rolled a two. So we are going to be attacked by a wandering monster in this tile here. Let's uh, mix this up and let's see what our uh, monster is going to be. It's an E15. So remember, the higher the value, usually the more dangerous the encounter. So let's find our E15. So this deck of monster cards, it includes the monsters from the base game. And it also includes monsters from one of the expansions. And those are on the back. So you can choose which side to use. I believe there's also a newer deck out that has a couple, um, has monster stats from an, uh, even a newer expansion. So we're looking at E15 here. Let's see what we're gonna be fighting. And some zombies. Okay, so zombies are undead. They have an attack value of 35. So they have a 35% chance of hitting us. They have a defense of zero. 
they have a damage modifier of zero. They have no treasure, so that really sucks. Uh, fighting them is just an absolute kind of waste of our energy. Uh, they, and they are also a pack. And what a pack means is a pack, you have to attack them in order. And they also add strength. They add to their attack value for um, the more that is in their pack. I had a hard time saying that that sentence. Uh, so any, I believe it's, um, this may be a rule I'm getting wrong, but we're just going to go with it for now. I'm pretty sure any number in their pack greater than the first one adds 5 to their attack value. So 5, 10, 15. So that's going to bring their attack value up to 50 until I start killing them one by one. I'm going to go ahead and just double check that actually I do have a sheet right here, a handy monster ability sheet. So let's see, pack. Yep, here we go. So at the start of each combat round, each monster still alive beyond the first adds a plus five. Yep, I was right. For once, I got a rule right <laughs> that I remembered. Okay, and they also have disease. So what disease does is I believe any time I take damage, I also fill in one of my disease pips. And as when a monster scores a natural, oh no, I, when, when the monster scores a natural one on the damage die, even if I don't take damage, uh, then I will have to fill in my one of my disease pips, um, even if the monster doesn't deal any damage. When the time track is refreshed, so when you go through this time track one time completely, then you have to take care of your disease and poison. So if you have any of these pips filled in on disease or poison, you roll a d10, and if you roll under the number of pips you have filled in, something bad happens to you. I've already been, I think I was diseased right away on something that happened to me here, and I had a potion of cure disease, and I used it right away to cure two pips of disease. So this is like the disease dungeon here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, fight these, uh, these monsters here these zombies. So I do the dice rolls a little different. I, it saves a few seconds, but in a game that has so many uh, rolls, I find that that can really add up. So normally what you do is you take your D100 and you roll to see if you hit. If you do hit, then you would roll the uh, tens value to find out which location you hit the monster in because if you hit them in the head, you do more damage. If you hit them in their legs you or their feet, you do less damage. And then you roll your D6 to find out how much damage you do. What I do is I just roll all three at the same time. And then if I do hit, I use the uh, ones value that I already rolled as the hit location. And then it just saves a few, just saves a few rolls. And there are a lot of dice rolls in this game. So for my attack, I am using a melee weapon. I'm using my bastard sword. It's a two-handed sword and it gives me a plus three to my damage. And since I'm using my melee attack, I'm gonna use my strength value to attack. And my strength is a 65. So I have a 65% chance of hitting these zombies here. And let's see what I can do. Okay, oh my gosh, look at that, a four. You guys saw it. I have been so lucky with my dice rolls in this in these last few games. So I rolled under my um, strength value and I rolled under a 10 or under. So that means that I get to upgrade my strength. I get to add experience to my strength. Now, since my strength is my primary stat, my primary stat has that star filled in. That means I get to add two pips to it. So I'm going to go ahead and fill this in. Now I only need one more pip filled in to add to my strength value. And then I get to add five to, I think it's to my primary strength, which would boost my total up to 70. So we're doing really good on strength right now. Now that's pretty cool. Okay, so we hit the zombies with a four. We hit them on four. We, oh, you know what we didn't do though? Let's back up. At the start of each combat round, we're supposed to roll to see what the monster's reaction is. And we rolled a four. Okay, so we won't have to modify anything. We won't have to retcon anything because a four is the monster will attack as normal. So we're good, we're good. Almost cheated there. Luckily got caught. 
So uh, we hit them in the arms and the arms has no damage modifier. We did roll a six though and our bastard sword is a plus three so we hit for nine damage. When you're fighting a pack the damage does carry over. So we, uh, we hit the first one, we hit for four, eight, and then nine. So now there's only two left. There's only two zombies left. So now they attack us and their value now is 40. So they have a 40% chance to hit us. And if they roll a one, we get diseased. Okay, that was very good. So they rolled a 70 and a four, so they missed. So we don't have to do anything. So now let's see what the monster's uh, reaction is. This is the top, this is a new round. Uh, a nine, so a nine here. Uh, the monster, a monster damage last round, it will escape. Okay, so we can do a block test to try to block the monster from escaping, but you know what? Because this monster doesn't offer anything if we kill it, there's no reason to kill this monster at all. Um, we are just going to let that monster escape. So the zombies shamble off and now we don't have to deal with them. You know, if they had a quest item that I was looking for, then you would probably want to attempt to stop them, but there's no reason to do that. So we're gonna add the token back in because we can reroll the zombies, get rid of those two zombies. And now we are at the top of a new turn. Actually, that was our uh, random encounter there. So um, we checked off I-5 there, seven o'clock. And now we need to just continue to explore. Um, you know what I forgot to do here? I didn't notice that is that is actually a door there. Um, the door markers on these tiles are a little hard to see. I wish they had a little more kind of highlight or something because I totally missed that when I laid down that tile. So we need to draw a door counter. So these have been shuffled. The door counters, there are a number of O's in here, which means that they are open. And then there are some other doors that we'll have to look up on the chart that might be trapped or might need a lever or a key or something. So I chose this exit to explore. So let's flip that over. And we have a T1 door. So let's see what a T1 door is. We're gonna look up at our doors here and we see a T1. Okay, it is trapped. The door is closed and trapped. It's a trapped door. We need to make a dex test. If we succeed, we open. If we fail, uh, we lose one HP and we can use our traps skill. Okay, so uh, traps doors. Some doors are trapped and will harm the adventurer if the trap is not disabled when they attempt to open the door. So the adventurer must pass a trapped door test in order to change its door code to an O. Okay, so T1, so we need to do a dex test. So dex is not my best strength, but I do have the trap skill, which is going to give me a plus five. I bet my dexterity is only a 30. So I have a 35% chance of uh, opening this uh, door here. Let's see what we get. And no, not at all, that's an 80. All right, so we're gonna lose one HP, which is gonna take us down to 16. Okay, we've already searched in this room, so um, now we need to um, go back to the top of the round here. Okay, so top of the round, we're going to mark off another number on our, um, on our time there which takes us to nine o'clock. And now since we can't really explore, we can't move through an exit, we can't encounter the area because we've already encountered everything we can in there. Now we just need to pick an exit to move. So we can either move back or we can attempt to open up this door one more time. All right, we can attempt to open up, uh, attempt as many times as we want. But let's say I'm a just a little bit stubborn. So I'm going to try it one more time. So I need the 35%. And oh my gosh, another skill roll. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love my dice rolls in this game. All right, so I am going to go ahead and um, I'm going to try to upgrade my dexterity. So I'm going to add a uh, shade and a pip on my dexterity chart there so I can work on getting my dexterity up because my dexterity is low. So we successfully disarmed that trap. 
that gets uh, shuffled back into the door. And then we take our stack of tiles here because we chose that exit to go. We're going to go into a new room. The white arrow goes there. And then we can move into that room. Yellow rooms are considered empty. And then now we can, uh, now we can search. And the yellow, we add zero. So uh, I'll go ahead and search because it's always, it's always uh, fun. So let's see, hopefully we roll high again. And oh my gosh, another low roll. Okay, this is bad. <laughs> on this chart, you wanna roll high. So on the F chart there, we rolled um, a two. It, uh, so we have to take two time. So man, that, that really sucks. This, this caused like a huge, we just spent so much time searching in this crowded room. So we have to mark two. And that does mean we have to mark another oil. So we've used three flasks of oil so far and only four rooms. Okay, and then let's see what else this says. This is kind of hard to get on the, on the uh, camera there because I'm using a shorter tripod. Uh, the adventurer moves away some junk and here's a click. A trap is triggered. Roll a D10 on the G, on the geograph. Okay, so we have to roll to see what kind of trap we triggered. That's awesome. I was like lifting up this casket or something or yeah, you know, probably opened up that coffin there and uh, triggered a trap. All right, so we rolled a four. So let's see what trap we're going to have to face off against. A snake pit trap. Part of the dungeon floor has been rigged to fall away, dropping anyone foolish enough into a deep pit where a giant snake waits for his next meal. Test snake trap. First time the adventure entered. Okay, so we have a snake trap and we have to uh, test dexterity minus 15. If we succeed, we avoid. If we fail, oh man, this is so bad. If we fail, we have to do a belt check, which means we, will lo we might lose an item that we have attached to our belt. We will also lose two HP and then we will also have to encounter the giant snake. On top of that, we have to add one to our time. Okay, so a dex minus 15, but we can use traps, aware, and lucky. Luckily for us, we have traps, we have aware, and we have lucky, which brings us up to 15. So our adjusted dex total is actually 30. So we have a 30% chance to dodge this trap. Okay, come on, I need a low roll here. 80, man, no, okay. So we fall into the snake trap and now we have to face off against the giant snake. I was just wondering if there's a giant snake here. One thing we forgot to do, and let's back up and talk real quick about a reason why we might have wanted and we probably should have blocked those zombies and killed them. One important thing I completely forgot, and that is the combat track. Anytime you successfully defeat an enemy, you add them to this combat track. And as you fill up the combat track, you get those rewards. So if we would have blocked those escaping zombies and killed them, I could have added a plus one to my primary strength. So we probably would have wanted to do that because they were pretty easy. So that was a bad decision on my part. But, um, all right, so we now have to face off against this giant snake. And I need to, I'm going to uh, roll, I'm going to write the um, stats here on this chart here. And if we, if we, okay guys, well that giant snake is no joke. He's got three defense. Um, he has, or he or she, it has uh, 16 hit points. It does plus two damage and it poisons us. I think I might just try to escape. And let's see, an escape combat, oh, it's a dex roll. Um, hmm, man. This might be the end of Hindar here. Uh, we might have, we might have uh, come to the end of our adventure. Um, okay, so I went ahead and dealt with the giant snake off camera and it wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, the first thing that we needed to do though is did our belt check. So when you have to do a belt check as a failure or something, what that means is you roll a D10 
and if you roll on the slot that coincides to something that is in your belt well then that uh, item is lost i rolled a 10 so i had nothing in the 9 and 10 slot so i didn't lose anything on my belt and so the giant snake he had an attack value of 55 a defense of 3 16 hp he did plus 2 damage and if he ever rolled a natural one i was poisoned well once again i got like pretty lucky with my rolls i had a couple sixes i think on my damage so i was able to use my mighty blow which the mighty blow is if you have a, a strength of 50 or higher then you get to use uh, this mighty blow which adds a basically an exploding uh, die if you roll a six for your damage you get to roll again and then you get to use that uh, that that total as the damage so i did some really good damage to the giant snake even though he had a defense of three and i was pretty easy to dispatch it he did do uh, a couple points of damage to me bringing me down to 13 health and he did do one point of poison to me so we added the giant snake here to our combat track and then that would give me now the plus one to my primary strength as a reward. So I have added uh, my, I've brought my primary up to 51 plus my adjustments of 15. So that brings my new total for my strength up to 66. Um, additionally, the giant snake does give us 1D, um, 1D 100 gold pieces. Okay, so let's see here. Um, oh my God nine gold pieces once again i roll low but unfortunately that was not a skill check so i just get to add uh nine gold pieces so i'm not doing too bad i've got three healing potions i've got 13 hp only one poison so i can uh, pretty safely continue into the uh, dungeon a little bit more so let's go ahead and do like one more tile okay so um the first thing we need to do is so that was on the that was on the searching so searching is at the end of their phase so the first thing we need to do is we need to add a pip here to our uh, track which that is going to a um cause us to roll for a random encounter uh, one in six chance and we did roll a three, so we are going to have a random encounter here. All right, so let's see what we're going to be fighting. We are going to be fighting E4. Okay, E4. Uh, E4 is a giant spider. Giant spider, he, it has a attack value of 30, a defense of two, minus one damage, six HP. And when you kill it, you roll on the parts table. Parts table is kind of boring, only really if you're looking for it for a quest. So there's this HP there, and it does have the web ability. So let's see what the web ability does. Uh, at the end of each combat round, basically at the end of each combat round, we need to take a dex test. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is, is we want to see what the uh, spider is going to do. It's reaction, and that is a nine. Uh, was the monster damaged last round? It will escape no because there wasn't a last round this is the first round okay so this is the first round of combat here we are going to attack it we now have a strength of 66 using our bastard tort sword so we have a 66 percent chance to hit the snake and a 10 yes <laughs> that is awesome another successful skill roll so we get to fill in this uh, pip here which is the um, upgrade pip so now I believe we get to add a plus five to my strength. And let me just double check that. Uh, yes, in the rule book, page 10, once an experienced track has been completely shaded and reached the upgrade symbol, the player adds a plus five to their characteristic or skill. And so we're going to add a plus five here. So I think, I believe that's to your primary. So 55 or 51 now becomes 56. And the total now plus 15 adjusted is a 71. Okay, so uh, so we rolled a zero for the uh, location, the hit location there. So let's uh, 
look at our location chart. So that's a 10. So we hit this spider in one of its feet. <laughs> so it's going to be minus one damage. So that's three. However, our uh, bastard sword does th plus three. So that's six. But he has a defense of two. So that's going to be four hit four hit points. So he is down to two. So now the spider is going to attack us back with a 30% chance to hit and it rolls a 91. Okay, so now let's see what its um, reaction is going to be. A three. Uh, the monster will attack as normal. All right, so we attack it now with our new 71%. Okay, so we rolled a 27 there and uh, five points of damage. We hit it in its seven. We hit it in its, in its off weapon, I guess just in one of its arms or something, because uh, spiders don't have off weapons. Uh, we did five points of damage, plus three is eight, minus two is six. So we easily dispatch of the giant spider, adding its card back to the deck there. Okay, add its token back to the pool. And then we will fill in the giant spider on our uh, combat track here. So giant spider on our way towards another reward on the combat track okay so we, that was our random encounter and now we have to choose um, an exit and uh, we're going to continue on this direction so we're going to draw the top tile here and it is a blue objective room so in some quests you are looking for a certain objective um, in this quest we are not so we're just going to go ahead and move into this objective room i guess we uh, we did search that room because I got that trap. So we need to add a search token there. And then I am also go ahead and search the blue room, which does give us a plus 20. So actually, you know what we didn't do is uh, we didn't roll on our P1 chart, which will give us some spider parts that we can sell for gold. So uh, let's see what we have here. Spider parts uh, 18. Probably nothing great there. It's pretty low, but on our part chart here, we have a, let's see, what we roll? An 18 on a P1. We found an exoskeleton used to make armor and clothing for the rich, worth 13 gold. So we have, we found something that we can trade in for 13 gold. Okay, but in this blue room now, on this end of this turn, we can go ahead and search. And that's going to give us a plus 20. And that's going to be on the F table. Oh, let me just turn the F. All right. So come on. Something good. 20. Uh, 39. Uh, 59. Okay. 59 here. It's going to add one time. As I'm moving away some rubble, a weapon is revealed. Roll on the weapons table. Okay. First of all, let's add the time before I forget. Okay. So now we are at eight. So... One complete time uh, cycle has gone. We are going to have to use some food. So I'm gonna tick off a point of food that we're going to use. And I also have one pip of poison. So I need to roll the D10. And if I roll a one, then we have to trigger the poison. It was a two. Okay, so the poison does not get triggered. I don't think, I think it only goes down if you trigger it, but let me see here. Uh, poison here. Uh, when the time track is refreshed, the player must roll a d10. If the result is equal to or less than the number of poison pips shaded, the adventurer suffers HP equal to the number of shade pips. And the player removes one pip from the poison track. Okay, so I think, I think that reads that you only remove poison when the poison triggers. If somebody knows differently, uh, please let me know. Okay? I, a little weird to read that i can see it going either way but anyways now we can roll on our weapons chart so let's see maybe we'll find something better than the bastard sword but uh, the bastard sword is pretty good and we need to roll high uh 69 let's see here 69 um we found a halberd and plus two damage so the halberd uh is a two-handed plus two damage it is worth some gold, but it's not as good as the Bastard Sword. So we are going to go ahead and stash that in our pack. So our backpack here has 
places for things that we find that do have some damage to them. Um, so we found a uh, double-handed weapon, two-handed weapon. We found the halberd. Okay, it is, it's worth uh, 243 gold. It costs 47 gold to repair each pip. It has a damage value of plus two. And now let's see how damaged it is that we found. Uh, three, so on a three here, it has two pips worth of damage that we will have to repair before we can sell it for its uh, top top value there. So not, not bad, we can sell it for a little bit of gold and buy a couple potions or get some healing or something like that. So, all right, well, now I think I'm done. I was gonna end this a little earlier. I know this is a long video, but um, hopefully there weren't a, 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 a an abundance of rural errors. I'm sure there were at least a handful because I don't think I've ever played a game right, especially not on YouTube. Uh, that's some kind of law. That's some kind of a dungeon dive law. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys just kind of enjoyed seeing how the game is played. And now we're just going to continue. Oh, one thing I should show is on our calendar, because we went through the time cycle once, now we do want to fill in this chart down here, which is going to fill in this first one here. Now, once we go through that time cycle again, we're going to hit that one. And then that means we've spent an entire day worth of time down in the depths of this dungeon. So, all right, guys. Well, now we are done. This was a very long video. So I hope you enjoyed it. And we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.